Welcome to Aspects of Writing. I'm your host, James Kelly, here on KLAV 1230 on the AM dial. We are streaming live on Google+. And if you are just tuning in, you can go to youtube.com forward slash Aspects of Writing. That's one word. And make sure and click on the Featured button to view us live. Or you can listen to the show at your computer at klav1230am.com. Today we will be talking with talking about writing for newspapers and magazines. Whether you would like to write short stories or print uh, articles for magazines and newspapers, we're going to talk about the many ways you can do it, go about doing that and getting published. My guests today are authors Judy Logan, Darlin Breeze, and Tabidi Lewis. Tabidi, are you there? I am. How are you doing today, Jay? Great, sir. All right, before we get started, I would like to check in with, is Kevin on the line? All right, we'll probably check back with Kevin <laughs> later on. Um, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to Aspects Writing with me, your host, James Kelly, here on KLAV 1230 on the AM dial. Um, to start off the show, we would like to start off with a few fun facts and quotes, and I'm going to start with by reading the first one. Um, out of the 215 countries and regions, China, Japan, and India are the countries with the largest number of newspapers by average. Did you know that the top three selling newspapers in America are the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, and the New York Times? However, here in Las Vegas, the Review Journal is our top paper. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Darlene. Little and Tabidi, would you like to take number three? Sure. Um, the top three selling magazines in the world are People, followed by Time, followed by Sports Illustrated. That's interesting. And Judy, would you like to take the fourth one? Don't get it right, just get it written. James Thurber. And that's pretty much the way it should be, right? Right, absolutely. <laughs> All right. And Tabidi's calling in from Washington State. Tabidi, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I am uh, currently the Associate Chair of English and an Associate Professor of English and uh, American Studies at Washington State University, Vancouver. And I myself publish widely in the areas of African American literature, African American studies, and race and sport. And I teach about literature and sport. I'm from St. Louis, okay. Missouri, and while when I lived there, I used to write a a uh, monthly, a weekly column in one of the local newspapers. And I've written over the years for many different newspapers and magazines, such as The Source Magazine, Crisis Magazine, News One, and even I've also done some work uh, delivering. Uh, cultural commentaries uh, for some of the local uh, Portland radio stations. And I used to have a radio station I then. know, yeah. Once a week. So this is quite a treat. And I recently published a book that has really been uh, getting quite a bit of publicity and drawing quite a bit of interest and is really relevant to much of what is going on in contemporary sport culture. Uh, the title of the book is called Ballers of the New School race and sport in America, Third World Press. And I have a website that's tied to that, which is www.ballersofthenewschool.com. Uh, um, so I, this book deals with, you know, dynamics of race and sport in American culture, trying to sort of look at contemporary athletes uh, within the context of uh, the influence of hip-hop culture and, and, and engaging these notions of post-race America. Right. Uh, and I'm, I'm using the book to engage um, race in America because, you know, people don't feel comfortable discussing this topic, but right, yeah, or right. it inundates our society. So I, that's the, the gist of me. <laughs> well, you also, you've written for several newspapers and magazines. In fact, you wrote for The Source Magazine, Crisis Magazine, News One, The St. Louis American, and The St. Louis Post-Dispatch, and then Oregon Humanities Magazine, and the or, is that Organian? <laughs> Oregonian, yeah. Oh, Oregonian, okay. <laughs> So Correct. you definitely have experience in this field. A little bit, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And Judy's joining us in the studio. Judy, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, James. Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, I'm thrilled welcome. to be here. Thank you. I was born in Boston, in case you can't tell. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> right. Not Texas, for yeah. sure. <laughs> and I was raised in Quincy, the city of presidents on the south shore of Massachusetts. I moved here to Vegas in 2010, and I joined the Henderson Writers Group, where I'm currently serving as a uh, 
librarian. And although I'd been writing forever, I like to joke that I probably signed my own birth certificate. <laughs> uh, my fellow writers and authors at the Henderson Writers Group have helped me you know, write conscientiously. And that's the whole point, writing conscientiously. I credit that help with my publishing three short stories, uh, two of them in Wildflower Magazine, and one in the Writer's Block 4, which is currently uh, available for sale. Okay. And I want to thank also the Las Vegas Writers Conference, which is held each year in April, because through that I actually signed a book contract this year for my first novel. All right. So I'm thrilled. Thank you. You're welcome. And Darlene, why, who's also here in the studio, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, James, and thank you so much. Uh, like Judy, I was practically born with a pen in my hand, so <laughs> I've always written, but uh, just the th- last few years have I been serious about it. Uh, my childhood was rather isolated. I lived on a copper and gold mine with my grandparents. Okay. I have no siblings, so writing was, you know, what we did. The great escape. Uh, well, and of course, in those days, no television, and it, because we were isolated, we didn't have um, newspapers. You name it, we didn't have it. <laughs> That's, so you so, created it. Well, <laughs> had to, you know. So I had imaginary friends. I had imaginary everything, you know. So it worked out pretty well as for me. As long as you still don't have imaginary friends, you're okay. <laughs> Oh, darn. I knew there was a catch to those people. I wondered why they looked so ghostly. I just thought they were dieting. But, you know, I've been a little of everything. I uh, taught school. I was an import-exporter. I um, have owned several businesses. I owned a a glass factory, actually, and a beauty shop, uh, some other stuff that uh, came along the way. But then... uh, after I retired from teaching, I, uh, I got very serious about my writing, and I've been published in Books in Motion, uh, Critics Online. I've been in every uh, of the writers', writers anthologies and uh, just wrote the foreword to the latest one. And I have uh, a series of books, A Life of Crime, Cruising for Crime, and coming out this year through uh, Mystic Publishers will be... Uh, my last of that series, which is called A Twist in Crime. And so, you know, writing is sort of what I do, and it's where I live, and it's what I love to do. That's great. I would like to go back to um, uh, Judy for a minute. You, I know you, you landed in Las Vegas in 2010. Yes. But your writing career started way before then. Oh, way, way I'm back, yeah. yeah. Um, I've always written. Um, I wrote plays in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, then I got very involved in my church, and I began writing sermons and became certified to be a lay preacher. And um, I'm putting together now a book of sermons that I've done for children and adults over the years. Um, and I've, I've write for a living every day, although it's very different than my fiction writing. My QA people keep reminding me, you're writing technically, Judy, not <laughs> fiction. Um, I write training programs for a big healthcare company. Oh, great. Yeah, okay. which is really great. And then at night, if I'm not too tired, I'll do something creative like write fiction. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'd like to remind our listeners, you're, you're, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to Aspects of Writing with me, your host, James Kelly, right here on KLAV 1230 on the AM dial in Las Vegas. And on your computer, you can find us on the internet at klav1230am.com. And if you're trying to view us live, you can go to youtube.com forward slash aspects of writing, and that's all one word, aspects of writing. And then make sure and click on the featured button. Uh, my guests are Judy Logan, Daryl and Breeze, and Tavidi Lewis. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the whole aspect of newspapers and magazines, and I'm going to let Judy start with that. The beginning of the American newspapers as we know them today began in the early 18th century with the publication of the first colonial newspapers. It was James Franklin, Benjamin Franklin's older brother, who first made a news sheet containing more than just a gobbled mass of stale items. James Franklin published the New England Current at his own risk. He was encouraged to do so by a number of associates. These respectable characters were known as the Hellfire Club. Sounds like Boston. (laughs) (laughs) They succeeded in publishing a paper of different casts, which, although it shocked the New England orthodoxy, nevertheless proved vastly entertaining and established a kind of literary precedent. Okay, and Tabidi, I'm going to let you pick up from there. Hello, Tabidi, are you there? Yes, I'm here. (laughs) Um, The... The first printed newspaper, am I moving along effectively, or am I incorrect here? Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to read the next one. Why don't you 
Yeah, and we're going to let Darlene pick up after that, and we'll get right back to you, Tavidi, I promise. <laughs> the turbulent years between, the seven, between 1775 and 1783 were a time of great trial and tribulation among newspapers. Uh, interruption, suppression, and lack of support uh, checked their growth substantially. Although there were 43 newspapers in the United States when the Treaty of Peace was signed in 1783, as compared to 37 on the date of Battle of Lex Lexington on 1775, only a dozen remained in continuous op operation between the two events. And most of those had experienced delays and difficulties through lack of paper, type, and patronage. Uh, not one newspaper in the principal cities, Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, continued publication throughout the war. When the colony forces were in uh, possess possession, uh, royalist papers were suppressed, and at times British occupation revolutionary papers moved away or were discontinued. Or they became royalists, only to suffer at the next turn of the uh, military for uh, fortunes. Thus, there was an exodus of papers from the cities along the coast to the smaller inland plains. Or places where all, all alone it was possible for them to continue without interruption. Uh, scarcity of paper was uh, acute. Type worn out could not be replaced. Uh, so obviously there was a problem during this time just to get the paper alone to, to write with. And then you had to have someone to read it. And so. you know, James, that brings up an interesting point. Actually in 1692 with the Salem Witch Trials of Boston, part of the problem there was an economic issue. The land had been subdivided so many times between succeeding generations that there were no trees left to pay Reverend Parrish. Ah. And that's part of what drove his paranoia, and obviously it spilled over to his kids. So by the 1700s, those lands had not replenished those trees the way they needed to. They used it for fuel, they used it for paper, they used it for any number of things, and it was very scarce. Yeah, okay. Darlene, All would you right. like to take up from there? Well, yes. Well, Mr. Noah Webster of Webster Dictionary fame was strapped for money uh, back <coughs> in the late 1793 era. So he borrowed $1,500 from uh, Alexander Hamilton to move to New York City and edit a Federalist newspaper. In December, he founded New York's first daily newspaper, American Minerva, which was later known as the Commercial Advisor. He edited this paper for four years, writing the equivalent of 20 volumes of articles and editorials. He also published the semi-weekly publication, The Herald, a gazette for the country, later known as the New York Spectator. As a partisan, he soon was denounced by the Jeffersonian Republicans as boy and <laughs> catch me on these words he was pulsimonious there we go half begotten self-dubbed patriot an incurable lunatic <laughs> and a deceitful newsmonger boy i hate this guy already <laughs> pedagogue and a quack oh. fellow federalist corbett labeled him a traitor to the cause of federalism calling him a toad in the service of, boy, watch this. He was well-liked. Sans <laughs> colotism <laughs> or the like radical a... partisans of the lower classes, typical urban laborers, a spiteful viper and a... <laughs> Are you through? <laughs> Almost. <laughs> oh, this guy's awful. Anyway, I can't go on. He's too terrible right, to talk right, about. Yeah. He was... <laughs> The master of words was distressed. Even the, wor the use of words like the people, democracy, and equality in public debate bothered him, for such words were metaphysical abstractions that either have no meaning or at least none that mere mortals can comprehend. Whew, well, that was a mouthful. <laughs> wasn't it, though? <laughs> it sounds like our campaigns today. I know. Yeah, I know. It's not like we were campaigning. Right. Uh, if you are listening, you're listening to Aspects of Right with me, your host, James Kelly, here on KLAV in Las Vegas, and my host are Judy Logan, Daryl and Breeze, and Tavidi Lewis. Um, this is going to be for the panel, and um, if you need to know something about submitting articles or newspapers, um, how do you format your work, and who do you present it to? Tavidi, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, I like that question because uh, yeah, I teach uh, often creative nonfiction courses, but just my own career. Uh, so one of the things that I think uh, one has to do, say if you're trying to, to submit editorials, for example, in a local newspaper, mm -hmm. uh, the first thing one wants to do is make sure that they're really clear regarding the guidelines. And I know that sounds very simple, but it's a, remember, they're reading hundreds of submissions a day 
are, you know, they're getting quite a, a nice volume. I won't say the exact number. And so they're looking for every reason to dump you out. Okay. One of the other things that I look to do is, say, for an editorial piece is, you know, it sounds obvious, but this notion of looking for really kind of unique topical issues. Uh, one thing I was thinking about myself re uh, last week was, oh, I'd be nice to write a piece looking at the upcoming 4th of July, and what kind of angle could I use? And I was going to examine an essay written by Thurgood Marshall and Frederick Douglass's uh, What to the American Slave is the 4th of July and situate that through the context of the 4th of July. And maybe it flies, you know, so you want to think about contemporary uh, issues. But if they, if they select e e electronic submissions or hard copy submissions, you have to keep in mind that some of them, you know, uh, you know uh, may uh, ask you to submit multiple uh, things at a time. And, um, and also, it's important that, I mean, I think those are the kind of basic things that one wants to keep in mind. Uh, think about their page limits. What do they ask for? You also should really pay close attention to the kind of content that those different journals uh, or magazines are asking for, because... You, you, you want to make sure you're really aligning yourself to the type of work that they are, uh, that they are uh, dealing with. And one, th one good thing that writers could do as you're submitting your stuff to multiple places is you, know, you can make a kind of spreadsheet for yourself to track your submission. Okay. And, uh, you know, just publication name, submission date, those kind of things, uh, so that you can really sort of, you know, keep an idea of where you sent things. And, you know, I think people should keep in mind that so many people are submitting pieces that these editors um, are are just. I want to reiterate, looking for reasons to reject pieces. So, um, well, really I think isn't it also important to make sure that you're you're targeting newspapers and magazines that deal with the articles that you've written? I mean, I would think that's that's important. You have to definitely well, research that. Th exactly, and as but also, so you may write something that maybe it may not function for some of the magazines that are out there and you begin to say, well, maybe this needs to be something for a book project. But yes, without a doubt, things that you've written or things that you're thinking about writing, they, you know, you say, okay, well, this will work here. Sports Illustrated, uh, River Teeth for this, Fourth Genre for that, this particular newspaper, Wall Street Journal, you know, US Today, USA Today, those places, it becomes a little more difficult. So the key is that pitch too, really pitching with, with vision. To the uh, to the different uh, uh, journal, the newspaper editors, et cetera, et cetera. I think uh, you have a very good point there. I think that's very solid. And there, uh, if I may interrupt for sure. just a second, there's oh, yeah. sure. Thank you. There's a, a number of excellent uh, publications that you can access uh, to look up your audiences, to look up topics, things like the Writer's Market Guide, things like Gale Publications. Every imaginable publication on every topic, every. Uh, industry, anything you would want to look will be found in Gail's publication. So I think if you really hone down what genre you want to write in, what your topic is going to be, and your slant, not all magazines are created equal, so you want to look at your slant. You wouldn't send, you know, an article on dog sledding to, you know, Southern Comfort uh, or Southern whatever that is. Living, Southern yeah. Comfort sounds quite right about that. <laughs> I said, what did you have before you came to, <laughs> to the studio? Really? It should have been a liquid lunch, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> Darlene, how do you feel about that? Well, you know, I agree with what both of them have said, but I want to point out that there are other avenues to getting name recognition through the newspaper. And sometimes when the uh, editors, the people who pick up your articles, recognize your name, that's a kind of a foot in the door. And one way you can do that is by writing letters to the editor uh, predicated on articles that the newspaper has printed or in response to other people who have written to uh, the letters to the editor column. Something else you might uh, consider, many newspapers, and I know a lot of magazines also, uh, conduct con uh, contests, usually holiday-centered, but they'll have a Christmas uh, contest, uh, you know, a holiday, uh, Fourth of July type of thing. These are ways to uh, promote yourself and also get the editors to recognize your name the next time you put in a serious article. Do you have anything else to add to that, Tabidi? Yeah, can I can I just tail in on to uh, the last comment? Was that uh, sure. was that that was Darlene? Darlene, uh, excellent point. Uh, one thing you talked about holidays. 
one thing a writer could do is just think about different holidays and find angles, write them ahead of time. And then as those periods come, perfect times to send out those editorials, you know, as you go along. Well, that's a question I have for all three of you. Do you, uh, and this is for all three of you so anyone can answer, do you write articles in advance in anticipation of the coming year or whatever. Absolutely. I, I think most magazines and newspapers that I've dealt with look for a six-month lead time for any uh, seasonal material. Okay. So if you're going to write something for Mother's Day, you better get it in by August or September of the previous year. Hasn't there been That's yet? true. And I think most of us do that. We do write articles or uh, stories ahead of time and then anticipation of somebody wanting that type of story Mm -hmm. you know especially when it comes to the holidays they're always looking for something to fill in hopefully to uh, you know kind of a cushion from some of the uh, bad news that we get all the time and to be the same for you uh yeah or at least notes sort of outlining the ideas and and as i was saying sometimes i will uh craft a sort of pitch to to that uh, editor and see if there's some interest as well. But, you know, with or without them, I agree with the group. I'm writing because I love to write and I want to explore different ideas, and so someone will take it. So, and I also feel that people should uh, re- remember that I've met and gone to listen to but interacted with a, an enormous number of writers, and so uh, people who you see in print have probably, ex- not probably, experienced far more rejection than accepted, and that is just a matter of a, a plethora of things that have nothing to do with your talent often. So you just can't be uh, sort of disenchanted because your work doesn't get published. Well, in that regard, it's the same as for authors as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's correct. Yep, absolutely. And James, just one last thing, if I may. You might want to also check things like Writer's Magazine, because they often have calls for submissions. And a lot of the uh, books that they mention, things like Glitter Train, is a wonderful magazine that calls for submissions for seasonal things. Um, things like Mused is another magazine. They all have their, you know, winter solstice, summer solstice, all that kind of thing. And they'll call for uh submissions for contests so that's Mm. another way to break into magazine writing okay all right darling did you have something to say well no i really uh am going along with what they have uh said here and i've had uh some success with uh the letters to the editor thing and i've also uh joined in the fray for the contests that the various uh newspapers run and was fortunate enough to win the uh review journals christmas contest here a couple years back so you know it's it's one now, more little notch in your uh, <laughs> absolutely. So, Tabidi, you had mentioned something about submitting a a line or something to the editor. So it's kind of like a, an author would do with a proposal. Yeah, some uh, an in depth query though, uh, and then with that query, if I have it pre written, I'll also attach it, or you know, making it clear, hey, I can, you know, I I just will attach it, and so. Um, if I have it all the way written, I will attach it. If I don't, I'll post the query. And that has been successful. And the key is enough detail that it, it's not just, oh, you just have a bit of an idea, but, oh, wow, you really and, – and making it clear that I've already written this. Would you like to take a look? You know. Well, this next question is going to be for all three of you, but I'm going to start off with Darlene. And, Darlene, um, has your work as a novelist been a benefit for writing newspapers and magazines or vice versa? Absolutely, because basically I'm a short story writer. I have managed to arc my short stories into novels. But in a short story, uh, you cut to the chase. You don't have a lot of time for uh, all of the scenery and all of the extraneous things that you do in a long-term novel. So for the newspaper, that's perfect. They don't want a lot of extras. They want the information. They want to know what the nitty-gritty of the whole subject is. And so since you don't have uh, time and space for all of the extras, actually the short stories have been invaluable for writing to that end. You know what's interesting with what we're talking about here with newspapers and magazines is you keep saying condense. And last week I had a show on about writing music. And oh. it's interesting how you you can have a novel that's five or 600 pages, but then when you write a short story, it's going to be a lot less pages. 
Then when you write for a newspaper or magazines, you've got to get a story in, in that short amount. And then a songwriter has to tell their story within two and a half to three oh, minutes. Yeah, I mean, I it's really interesting that, how yeah. we can manipulate words. Absolutely. Way. It's almost like poetry, which has to be so finely honed that one single word will give you a full-blown image. Yeah. And that's what music does for me. So, Tobiti, I'm asking you that same question. How has, how has writing novels influenced or has newspapers influenced your writing for novels? Well, I have not written a novel, but my collection of uh, critical essays, uh, you know, in Ballers of the New School, Race, Sport, and American Culture, actually, um, my book came about because I wrote, an, I used, I wrote that, the weekly editorial, and one of my colleagues said, you know, you should just turn a number of those into a book because uh, so many of them sort of take angles that deal with sport and race and society. And so uh, I guess for me, it has, I sort of, you know, did more research and took the best ones and evolved it to the book that I have. So actually your articles created your book. Yeah, they really stimulated the interest, showed me that this was something that I was really interested in and forced me to, uh, you know, uh, yeah, engage more research and, you know, sort of build out what would have been a two-page piece into a 30 or 40 page yeah, essay. Yeah. And and the same for you Judy. Judy, how how has that influenced you? Oh, it's influenced me tremendously. My novel began as a short story and there's I don't know if we have time for a quick little anecdote. Sure, go ahead. I had uh, I was working in a trucking company, believe it or not. Okay. And uh, you know, helping my husband support our three kids and I got laid off 2 weeks before Thanksgiving. And I said to the terminal manager, how can you do that? We live hand to mouth. We're struggling. I was a secretary. He, my husband was a factory worker. What are we going to do? And the terminal manager said, well, I'm sorry. You make my other four women lazy. I can't put it all in one basket. You're gone. So I went home, and I'm crying, and I'm all upset, and I see Atlantic Monthly of all the magazines to try to break into. And they're calling for a story. So I had a story in my head of my grandmother who uh, raised seven children on her knees, literally. She was an old Irish scrub woman, mm -hmm. and she went to Mass every day. Okay. And her husband died at 42, leaving her with seven little children. She was telling me this story one day, and she said that she was coming home from scrubbing floors at night, was sitting in Harvard Square, and it was sunny, and she thought, oh, my, maybe I'll see Danny, my husband. And she realized he'd been dead 10 years. Oh, and that struck me because she cried. Yeah. And I'd never heard my grandmother cry. So I wrote this story and I sent it in and I told Frank and the kids, when we win this contest, it's $1,000. We're paying off all our bills and we're going to go to the <laughs> Hilltop Steakhouse and we're going to have everything. Well, I got called back to work the week before Christmas and I forgot about the story. So I got home one night from work. I worked the overnight shift and Frank worked the day shift. And he said, come on, we're going to get dressed. We're going to the Hilltop. And I'm so excited, my heart is flowering, and I, I'm just hysterical. And we got there, and he did something we never did. He bought me a glass of wine, and something should have told me. <laughs> and you have not so, stopped since. <laughs> that was your clue. <laughs> so we thinking, can blame that on your husband. <laughs> I was thinking maybe I should have kept it up, but anyway. <laughs> we go to the hilltop, and soup to nuts, the glass of wine. I'm feeling very mellow and excited, waiting for this big hurrah, and he hands me the rejection manuscript oh. uh. and I burst it out crying <laughs> and I'm hanging my head sobbing until I hear all around me four other voices going <laughs> <laughs> and I look up and every one of them is crying and my little Michael who was five years old said but mama we still love you uh. so I had won the prize <laughs> yeah that's true oh, but it, you continue with your writing so I, it I definitely did. was the but I want to know about the wine <laughs> <laughs> I'll buy yeah. you a bottle. Yeah. Right. Not right now, darling. All right. We're going to read a few more quotes here. Um, I'm going to start off with – well, actually, this is an article, so we're just going to take turns reading it. Uh, the origin of the newspaper can be traced back to 131 B.C. The Romans carved announcements in stone and metal and posted them in public places. In 59 B.C., Rome published its first newspaper made public by Julius Caesar. And, Darlene, would you like to pick up from there? Well, we'll have to go back to the 8th century in China to find the world's first newspaper that resembled today's paper. In the 8th century, China created the, I'm going to say this badly, <laughs> Kayanizaboa Bulletin of the Court. The daily news was collected by editors and handwritten on silk by writers. It was then sent to the provinces and read by the imperial officers during the Kayan era. 
Well, so in other words, really, when they wrote it, it really wasn't for the mass or for the public. It was for the... It was not for mass distribution. You know, uh, an official would go to the village. He would read from his silk uh, writings, and the villagers would uh, take in whatever was of value to them. But no one got a newspaper. No one threw the news, the silk on his porch, right. you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, yeah. There were no and worms so there was no, in the no. jaws right. pulling the <laughs> silk newspaper from the front door. Uh, Judy, would you like to pick up from there? Sure. The first truly printed newspaper that we associate with today came only after Gutenberg invented the printing press in 1447. Even after this invention, people had to wait another 200 years until the first regularly published title in the English-speaking world. The earliest known copy of this newspaper is dated October 11, 1621, and it can be found in the collection of Charles Felicki of mm -hmm. New York City. Okay. And I think, Tobiti, do you have that part, or you want me to go ahead sure. with that? <laughs> the reason why the first modern newspaper appeared so late in history can be attributed to limited literacy prior to the 17th century. Okay. So before the 17th century, education was really considered to be somewhat of a privilege for the wealthy or the noble because people just weren't educated. Right. And yeah. I, I probably mentioned I'm the librarian, so you're yes, you you going to hear a lot of books <laughs> from me. But there's a wonderful book called The Printing Press as an Agent of Change by um, a scholar named Elizabeth Eisenstadt, and she really talks about the fundamental shift in the world as the result of the printing press. It's comparable to our shift in the world when computers came on board. Okay. So if anybody's interested in the history of print, it's an excellent book. It's very pricey, but it's an excellent book. Oh, well, thank you. Yep. Um, uh, we have a caller, and we're going to take that call right now. It's Judy McFadden. Judy, are you there? Hello, Judy? No? Hello? Judy, are you there? Yeah. This is James. Hi, Judy. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi, Judy. I think you know yeah, a couple of the people hear. here on the panel today. Yeah, I do. And, you know, unfortunately, I'm not able to listen to the show live, but I will listen to it tomorrow. Okay. But um, I know the panel. Um, my mentor, Darlene, oh, is yes. one of the first. Darlene listened to me read about McDuff until she got sick of it. <laughs> no, 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 Judy. She's a good egg. And, and Judy, I just saw Judy at my farewell party, and thank you again for that lovely journal, Judy. Oh, you're welcome, Judy. Miss you already. Yeah. I'll and you guys, James, you've got consummate professionals on your show. <laughs> oh, thank boy. you. I really do. I'm now, really that's happy. tough to live up to, Judy. <laughs> well, well, I know, but you guys, are, are members of the Henderson Writers Group, and <laughs> that was the the group that kind of pulled me through when I when I started to write my book. So, and I I put it in my acknowledgement. You know, you guys were a big help to me. Judy, were you there then? No, actually, I was still in Massachusetts. Okay, well, yeah. I know Darlene. Yeah, Darlene. I was yep. there right from yep. the start. Yeah. yeah. Well, just to tell people a little bit about who you are, Judy. Judy wrote a book was with life with life with McDuff, and he was a therapy dog. And in what people need to know now is you were living in Las Vegas until three days ago, mm -hmm. and yep. now you're in Ohio. And we miss yep. you. <laughs> and they're ready to throw me overboard. <laughs> <laughs> on a ship, they would throw me overboard because the weather is, is so – people, there were like 425,000 people without power oh, uh, wow. recently. Oh, goodness. And they are getting their power back on, but they're having heat advisories because it's like 95 degrees here, you know, with the humidity, and people do not have air conditioning. And they well, think you brought. They think you brought it with you from right. Las Vegas. <laughs> I, I, still, had a, I talked to a friend in Vegas, and she told me if they kick me out, she's got a room for me. Back oh, there. bless her oh, heart! Well, I have a spare bedroom too, Judy. Don't forget. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And I want you guys to know um, that uh, the July August issue of the Las Vegas Pet Scene Magazine has a review of the book, mm. and it's just everywhere. You know, you can get them at Albertsons, the libraries, Petland. You know, just oh, a bunch cool. of places. They're Free, but they got a very, very nice review of the book, and also the book that I have a story in called uh, "Dogs uh, and the Women Who Love Them." So, anyway, you guys might well check just that for out. everybody's information too. Uh, Judy's book about McDuff has literally gone all over the world. Oh yes, yeah. she got uh, emails from people in South Africa mm -hmm. talking about that book. That's and how it was popular one of the, it became. It was one of the finalists to be considered <coughs> on Oprah's show, yes, too. Yes, that's true. It's a wonderful <laughs> book. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. 
Yeah, and yes. and you know that if you Google Judy McFadden with aspects of writing, she's all over the world too. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I expect well, to I'll see your next book soon. And I'll tell you guys, Darlene and Judy, you are going to get publicity like you won't believe from being on aspect of writing. <laughs> well, thank oh, I'm you, so Judy. excited. Thank you. Well, Judy, thank you're thank our shining you. star. You're our big example. <laughs> thank you. Well, you guys are going to be shining too because uh, I think it's Tito. He puts it out there. You're, you're, you're guys, you're going to be everywhere. So, uh, oh, thank you. I just, uh, I'm, I'm glad to talk to you, and I wish everybody the world. And I miss you already. I oh, really I know. Do. We miss you, too. Miss you, too, Jude. So, you care. guys, take care. All right. Bless thank you. you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. We're going to read a few more fun uh, facts and quotes, and I'm going to start off with Judy. Judy, would you like to take the first one? Sure. Margaret Fuller. Uh, born 1810, died 1850, was the first American female foreign war correspondent. Described in her time as the most remarkable and greatest woman in America, Fuller opened many doors for American journalists. She was also quite a womanist. She's written a lot of literature about women's rights, even way back then. And Tabidi, do you have number two there? Yes. I'm happy to take number two. Samuel L. Simmons, better known as Mark Twain, 1835 to 1910, celebrated humorist, was well known as a writer of novels, short stories, and sketches. Clemens also worked a good part of his life as a journalist. He learned the printer's trade at a young age, and after a brief stint as a Mississippi steamboat pilot and service in the Confederate Army, he headed west and became a reporter for papers in Nevada and California. Clemens' accounts of adventures in the Sandwich Islands of the Holy Land as a travel correspondent were also published in newspapers as a series of travel letters. Clemens was surprised to discover on his return that the letters had made him famous from coast to coast. And, you know, can I just make a quick comment? Absolutely, sure. This is fantastic because he and many early uh, American writers, uh, Theodore Dreiser and others, I mean, has been essential to American literature, the very art of the narrative uh, developed in in this particular genre, uh, really key uh, in uh, contemporary. Uh, this is your business on the front. Hello. Yeah, I'm sorry, Tabidi. We just lost you for just a minute. Can okay. you hold on? Just one Please second here. Nine. Are you there? I'm here. Oh, okay. I'm, here. I'm sorry. We're, we're sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead, sir. I I thought I I was just talking about Clemens and the fact that he's a perfect example of the importance of American newspaper writing and its impact, the narrative, the the importance of narrative on the development of early uh, 20th century, late 19th century American literature. And wasn't he a Missourian as well? Uh, Indeed, indeed, yes. (laughs) As was I, along with you. (laughs) (laughs) Got the whole country covered. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) and feeling very proud, right, about that Missouri connection. That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> Tabidi, were the Sandwich Islands actually the islands of Hawaii? Uh, I, I actually don't know that myself. I, I, I'm I think, not going to tell you. Uh, I want to say they were only because I saw an old map recently, but I could be wrong. Mm. Okay. Well, I know he's an extensive traveler, Mark Twain. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, definitely. He was awesome. Well, just as a, as an aside for uh, Mark Twain, the term Mark Twain is actually uh, a measurement of water. The old riverboat captains used to go up and down the, the rivers, and because the tides were always changing, they didn't know how deep the river was. So they would throw a line with a, a rock or something tied to it overboard, and if it was deep enough, then the ship could sail through. If not, they were going to get stuck on a sandbar and, and uh, get you know bogged down so samuel clemens was actually uh, taking the uh watermark as as his name yeah, yeah. and um and he can feel it, learn quite a bit about you know just remembering you have to learn how to read i mean he has wonderful accounts of uh, reading the mississippi river and and knowing it pretty much like uh memorizing it and then reading if it's changed you know he talks about that very art of uh, of being a steamboat captain and how difficult it actually is. Yeah. So, 
Well, we had um, – Sue just Googled the – just because it happened to come up about the um, Sandwich Islands, and she just Googled it. And I guess it was part of the ho- Hawaiian chain. Woo. It is. <laughs> <laughs> that would not be good to be wrong as the librarian. <laughs> <laughs> would not have been something, though. <laughs> I know. Give me that wine. We'd have some calls on that one. <laughs> and I'm going to let Darlene take number three here. Okay, and this is about uh, Miss Nellie Bly, whose name was actually Elizabeth Conk. Cochran Seaman. Uh, she was born 1867 and died 1922. She was a world traveler reporter. Bly got her first newspaper job in Pittsburgh after writing an angry letter in response to an article titled What Girls Are Good For? Ooh, that's a hot one. Mm-hmm. She later <laughs> gave up her Pittsburgh column on society, theater, and art for more daring reporting for the New World for pardon me for the New York world okay and Tabidi do you have number four there for Grantland Rice indeed I do okay Grantland Rice 1880 to 1954 one of America's best known and respected sports writers Rice saw sports as life his column sports light appeared in more than 100 newspapers he estimated that he wrote 1 million words a year 3,000 words a day and traveled 15,000 miles a year to bring stories that is incredible. I, I can't even imagine writing 3,000 words a day, and I am a writer. so <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I do and don't realize it. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, Judy, would you like to take uh, the fifth one? Sure. Ernie Pyle. Always reminds me of Gomer Pyle. I don't I know. know why. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he was uh, born in 1900, died in 1945, and he was perhaps the best-known reporter of all time. Pyle covered the human side of the news in a folksy, chatty style. With his wife, Jerry, he traveled the United States and the world in search of stories about ordinary heroes. During World War II, Pyle mixed with soldiers in Europe and the Pacific and followed them into battle. His columns at home gave readers a glimpse of war from what he called the worm's eye view. Do you, any of you have any comments about any other famous writers who may have contributed to the newspaper or magazine era? You know, I think all of them probably have contributed in some way or another, whether they wrote uh, directly to the newspaper. All of them, I think, have been quoted, and uh, well, Somerset Mom comes to mind because he's of his quote about novels, and his famous quote that I love is that uh, there are only three rules about novel writing. Unfortunately, no one knows what they are. <laughs> and, and I just know, love that, but true. every time you write, read an article about writing, you, you will read about, you know, Mr. Somerset Mom and his comments. <laughs> and how about you, Judy? Do you have any comments about? I do. I, I, love the, um, I love the phrase that you asked me to read right from the beginning. Don't get it right, just get it written. My husband, God rest his soul, was functionally illiterate. Okay. Back in the days when men his age, he would have been in his 70s now, in, uh, then they didn't understand dyslexia. And yet he helped me get through a master's degree program okay. and would listen to me read my stories, but not until I had put the end on the story. Because he knew if I had an audience anywhere between chapter one and chapter whatever, I'd stop. And he would make sure that I would not let him hear my stories until I was done. And I have to credit him. He uh, actually s- dug a piece of cement into the ground and sunk the kid's playset into it and told me to come out and sign my initials in the rain. And, of course, that's long gone, but he's getting the joke now because I've got a book coming out. So. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. So, it's amazing how our lives influence our writing. Absolutely. You, know, I mean. you have to write. Don't wait till it's right. Just write. Mm-hmm. And that's so true. One of the things I'd like to talk about a little bit here is what it must have been like for Nellie Bly to have written when, at a time when women really weren't given the same education as men. Um, I, remember, I know from my own experience in my own family, in my grandmother's era, um, there were eight children. And it was the men who inherited the land and were allowed to go to school. Mm-hmm. She finished high school, but she wanted to go on to college, but that, that they thought that was foolish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting how women still made it through this. Absolutely. I think, if I may, I think that women have always had a drive, like any writer, to be able to witness to their world and to be able to help other people 
experience the world, perhaps through their eyes, or even give them something to think about and to look at their own world. And I think it's, it, women have always written, although they haven't always been published. And as we go back now through our church histories and things, we're starting to gather all that old material. I think of Sojourner Weaver, um, Sojourner, uh, she wrote, you know, slave narratives. I think of all the women that, you know, back in the 1700s that wrote stories that have never been published, but they're out there somewhere. Yeah. And Alice Walker talks about how she went in search of her mother's graves when she looked for Zora Neale Hurston's gravestone and found out that Hurston, although a PhD, had never been published because she was a black woman. And Alice Walker went looking for her grave, couldn't find one, because she had been, uh, Hurston had been uh, buried in poverty, and so she put a gravestone on there, Aww. and she brought Hurston's works back out so that we'd have the benefit of this fabulous woman writer. I, that is amazing. Yep. Tabidi, do you have anything to add to this? Uh, well, Hurston didn't get a Ph.D., but she did have a pretty illustrious uh, career. She got a B.A., anthropologist. I do agree, though, what the, all of the panelists are pointing out, uh, and people forget the importance of, of newspaper and magazine writing. Uh, you know, I'm an African-American, uh, teach African-American literature and American literature, and when I think about Hemingway, Ernest Hemingway, or Theodore Dreiser, or... Um, you know, any number of writers, you see the uh, impact of haunting the craft of the narrative. And when I think about African American literature, I think of people like Henry Highland Garnett and Alexander Cromel and uh, uh, Frederick Douglass, who started his own newspaper, mm, yes. the North Star, that was instrumental to getting information out and, you know, the newspaper really functioning uh, as a sort of, uh, you know, to, 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 uh, deal with issues of the day. Uh, and, you know, speaking of which, when I, when we, since we're talking about the importance of newspaper writers, one of the problems or one of the things that concern me today is that because of the advances in technology, we have this uh, real pressure. And I think all of the panelists understand that I'm talking about on writers to produce material quickly uh, before it becomes old news. Right, yeah. so yep. it becomes yep. old news in a matter of an hour, and there's a new posting and a new posting. And the problem that it poses for us is that instead of us getting the depth that we need, we're forced to give the sound bites or people we, we read more sound bite type news. And so as a result, it has the propensity for misguiding uh, readers. And you know, uh, it, it's good and bad and. You know, so it just it's really a, a sort of a conundrum, if you will, or a, uh, a complicated issue for for uh, for us. Uh, in the current day. Well, I think what you're saying is uh, very accurate, and unfortunately, because of the speed of the information, I do think we get a lot of misinformation. And yeah. if you start reading on any subject, you're going to have, you know, half a dozen or more opinions, all of them purporting to be the correct one. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, what's interesting, what you just said a while ago, Tabidi, as well, about the fact that news is instant, is I got up this morning, got on the computer, was looking over a few notes we have for the show today, and pops up on the screen is that Andy Griffith passed away this morning. Exactly. So, I mean, it's truly <laughs> instantaneous. Exactly. I mean, it, it's yeah, with yeah. this electronic media, yeah. you know, now it's going to be on the news tonight, but it's old news by this evening. Exactly, and I think that's the crux for us as writers, to recognize that we don't have tons of time anymore to develop a concept and then a product and put it out there. We have to hone our writing so that it's quick jabs, almost like a laser beam into an apple, because that's all the attention span we're going to get from people. So it forces us to hone our writing to be as crisp and as descriptive as it can be, almost like you, what you were talking about with music, James. Right, how they, how they create a story in three minutes. Absolutely, and writers have well, to do that. And also strategic, understanding there's this immediacy, the now. Mm -hmm. So we respond to that yep. as our first line of defense, but understanding that we're also crafting the depth that I talked about for the Atlantic Monthly, mm -hmm. for the, um, the uh, what, let me try to think of another journal or article, the Swanee Review or the Virginia Quarterly or the... Uh, Mother Jones. The, uh, you know, the Alaska Review or the Scholars, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Scholars Press or the Harvard Review or American Scholar or, you know, 
those type of entities so that we're responding to it, but then also uh, really pushing forward to craft the sort of in-depth work that will come out a week later in the New Yorker or somewhere like that. So it, it, it is a struggle. It's a struggle. Yeah. Well, does anyone have anything to add to our topic this evening? Well, you notice we're writers. We both start with the word well. <laughs> Actually, our other word is the. We do that very well. Oh, I want to thank subject. you for having us on the show today. I think uh, all of the comments from uh, Judy and from Tabitha, I think Tabidi. I've said, Tabidi. Tabidi. I said that incorrectly, were right on, and I really appreciate being here. Me too. I think it's been a, it's just been a joy, and I've learned, I've loved to hear what Tabidi has to say as a professor of Black Studies and American Literature. Um, I know a guy in Oregon who is actually writing a book about the Green River Murders. He was one of the investigative audi- um, auditors. No, what do you call them? Officers. Officers. Officers thank you. And, and he he didn't know about creative nonfiction, so I'm going to turn him on to you. <laughs> <laughs> and you had something to yeah. add. Say, you know, how about the, uh, the uh, what is the in true blood? If he's going to do that, he might want to think about Capote, right? And uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. But I really want to say that, um, you know, if, if, we, if I have a second to just sure. sort of, I know we're running out of time. You've got about just, two minutes. <laughs> okay. Just, you know, that we're, we're always, a, you know, people, you're a writer before you even know it. And, you know, I just think about the first time I realized the power of words and being a writer. I was uh, in the sixth grade and uh, and I was called into the principal's office and thought I was in trouble because we'd gone to a basketball game for free and we were forced to write about it. And the principal made me the reporter for the, um, for the, school, for the school basketball team. And uh, it empowered me because these eighth graders who've been kind of pushing me around suddenly uh, were trying to, you know, curry favor with me. And so I realized, wow, there's real power in doing this. <laughs> there yeah. is, absolutely. And I, I think I already I think I already told you I um I actually signed my own birth certificate. So there you go. <laughs> That's right. So uh so it's really uh you know it's really intriguing. So anyway I, I would just like to say for people to learn more about me and my work, uh please visit, you know, www.ballersofthenewschool.com dot com or www.thebdlewis.com and uh, you can, if you want to talk more, you know, I'd be happy to to uh, to talk. Okay, and I'm going to ask Darlene and Judy the same thing. Where they can, where can they learn more about your work? Uh, if, yes, if you want to look me up online, uh, my uh, name is Darlene D A R L I E N, like a lean on your house. Darlene <laughs> C Breeze dot com. Okay, and I have a um, website at sites.google.com forward slash site forward slash the LV writers slash Judy dash Logan. I'm also on Twitter at Shine Logan, and I'm also on Facebook at Judy Shine Logan. All right, we're going to go into so the much, last. James. Oh, you're welcome. I'm going to go into the last minutes of the, the segment here. Um, next Tuesday on July 10th at 2 o'clock, I'm going to pre- premiere a new show called Behind the Scenes with Sandy Castell and James Kelly, and we're going to take an in-depth look at what it takes to create, produce, and present some of Las Vegas' biggest shows, and we're also going to go behind the scenes of motion pictures and television shows as well as events. Um, on Tuesday, July 17th, Aspects will return to discuss writer's block. We will discuss the many ways to stir the creative juices and keep them flowing. Uh, my guest is going to be author Stephen Brannon, and that's going to be interesting because I'm actually going to talk about my novel for a change uh-huh. with Stephen. Okay. Uh, so to sum it up, um, on Tuesday, uh, Aspects of Writing with me, your host, James Kelly, and every other week, it's going to be behind the scenes with Sandy Castell and James Kelly. So I'm going to be on every Tuesday. It's just a different <laughs> show each Tuesday. Um, you can find links and information about my guests on the Aspects of Writing website at, at aspectsofwriting.com. Aspects of Writing broadcasts live at 2 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time here on KLAV and on the internet at, at klav1230am.com. Keep in mind, we rebroadcast every Wednesday on vegasallnetradio.com at 8 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time. You can view us live here in the studio at klav on youtube.com. Just go to youtube.com forward slash aspects of writing, that's one word, and click on the feature button. For future air dates and lineups, you can go to your computer and log on to aspectsofwriting.com, and we have that information there. Please sign our guest book while visiting Aspects of Writing website. You can post questions or comments on our guest book as well, and email us at aspectsofwriting at yahoo.com. Thank you for listening to Aspects of Writing here on KLAV. This is your host, James Kelly, reminding you, if you can dream it, you can write it.